So continuing, so we've introduced the idea of Ishwara. And the other thing that Patanjali says about Ishwara is when we come into that understanding of everything as one, then obstacles, they will fall away, which kind of makes sense. If I see everything as one, then where's the obstacle? It's all part of the oneness. But he mentions obstacles. So then Patanjali tells what these obstacles are. Vyari stiana samshya pramada alasya avirati branti darshanat de bhumikatva anavasti tatva chitta vikshe paste antaraya. So he describes this as antaraya. So antar means like in between. Like in French, we got the word entre. So in between, these are the things that stand between us and yoga. And they cause the chitta, the awareness, to become vikshepa, to become unsteady, to become scattered, to become less than focused, less than integrated. Vyadi basically means physical unwellness. So we can become imbalanced at the physical level. And if we're feeling sick or out of whack, what happens to our centeredness, our awareness is affected. Yeah? Stiana. We can have mental indisposition. We can be feeling, oh, just can't be bothered. We can be feeling lazy, yeah? If we're feeling lazy and languorous, can we have that clear awareness? No. Samshaya means doubt or indecision. So indecisiveness, I mean, one of the most famous plays in the English language, Hamlet, is, is all about the, the perils of indecision, yeah? Oh, sh so for example, imagine that you're a yoga practitioner, and normally you, normally you wake up at, let's say you wake up at 5.30 in the morning and you do a bit of meditation, do a bit of asana. But this morning you wake up at 4, the Brahma Muhurta, the perfect moment for meditation. You think, oh wow, oh great. And you think, oh, it's so quiet. Yeah, I feel like meditating. You think, oh, but maybe I should do pranayama first. Because if I do pranayama first, then I'll be more focused in my meditation. Actually, maybe I should do a little bit of asana because it's still, I still feel a little bit, if I'm going to have a nice long meditation now, if I do a bit of asana, I'll get more awake. You know? And then what happens? Then the moment's gone, yeah? So doubt and indecision, they can be a big barrier to practice. Pramada basically means um, not being um, attentive enough to practice, being careless, yeah? Like, thinking, oh yeah, I've got it all worked out. So not really being as deeply honest and attentive as we need to be. Just being a bit careless and lackadaisical. Alasi just basically means kind of laziness. Avirati. Avirati means not being respectful enough of the powers of the senses. So if I'm negligent of my senses or indulgent of them, they will come out of balance and that will affect me. Branti means having the wrong idea, missing the point. So not orienting to what, so instead of focusing on cultivating harmony, I'm cultivating on being able to perfect the one arm handstand, handstand. And if I focus on that in an imbalanced way, it could lead me away from yoga. So for example, if I feel, oh, I, need to be, I, I want to be a good meditator. I want to be able to fly in the sky. No, no, no. <laughs> the point is not to become good at the meditation technique. The point is to become more established in yoga. So if I misorient, this can be a, a, an obstacle. Uh, darshana labda bhumikattva. Another obstacle can be, let's say I'm practicing and I attain a particular vision of reality. I come to a state of balance and then I can't go back to it. So if I get attached to a certain state of awareness, this can itself be a barrier. It's like, say for example, I go to do yoga asana. I come to Venus's class and it's a beautiful sunny day and let's say we lift our chest up into cobra posture and looking up and there's a sunbeam coming through the room and I just have this beautiful moment of ecstasy and then this was on a Thursday and on next, next Thursday I'm going back I want to feel the ecstasy but if I go with that expectation what am I likely to experience? Disappointment, yeah? So this is the whole thing of like, I experience it, but I can't get back to it. As long as I'm attached to it being a certain way, it's almost like I'm blocking myself because where did the magic happen? The magic happened when I was just open to experience it. And then anavasti tattva is when the experience of integration is not steady. It comes and it goes. And then I become frustrated because it's not steady. So these are the obstacles. Can you relate to these things? Yeah, there's, there's, again, it's a very inclusive, comprehensive list. They can manifest in so many different shades. I mean, we could spend a whole hour or more talking about, or an hour talking about each of them and all the different permutations they can take. But 
as we're in this kind of whistle-stop tour of chapter one of the Yoga Sutra, basically, Patanjali is introduced, very practical distillation of all these things that we could experience as barriers to yoga. So he's introduced the obstacles. He's told us the problem. What's he going to do next? He's going to tell us the solution. He tells us the poison. He tells us the remedy. It's just fantastic. And what is the remedy? <laughs> the remedy is basically samadhi, yoga bringing the awareness into greater clarity. So now we come to one of those points in the text where an appreciation of the language and the grammar is quite key to understanding the importance of what happens in Sutra 33. In Sutra 33, Patanjali tells us how to overcome obstacles, how to cultivate yoga. And so this is the Sutra, he says, Maitri karuna murito pekshanam sukaduhka punya punya vishayanam bhavanata chitta prasadanam. So, chitta, the awareness prasadana. In order to bring the chitta into prasadana, potentially here gives us four ways to be, four ways to behave in response to four types of situation we can find ourselves in in life. So four ways to behave, four responses, maitri, karuna, murita, and upeksha, in response to four situations, sukha, dhukha, punya, and apunya. So when we're in sukham, kam means space, su, good, so good space. When we're in a pleasant situation, an agreeable situation, when things are nice, agreeable, when people are well disposed to us, potentially says maitri. Maitri comes from the word mitra, which means friend, so be friendly. When things are agreeable, good, when there's a good vibration, be friendly. If I want to be friendly to somebody or something, how do I need to be? I need to be open. I need to be present. Like if I'm going to really have a friendly conversation with somebody, I need to give them my focus, my attention, my presence. So when things are agreeable, be present. Now this may sound, oh yeah, fine. It's not always as easy as it sounds. I don't know about you, but I've experienced sometimes I have not been open to the unexpected gifts of the universe. Things are very nice, but I'm fixed, oh, I need to do this, I need to do that. And something lovely comes along and I have the idea, oh, I need to do this. And so I just rush by and miss this beautiful gift that was offered to me because I was fixated on some idea or I had some expectation of how it should be. Can you relate to that? So Maitri doesn't just mean being nice when people are being nice to us. It also means being open to the unexpected gifts of life. And another thing that this reminds us is that sometimes when things are easy, when things are supportive, it can be easy to take it for granted. It can be easy to kind of get a little bit lax. So when things are agreeable, be friendly, be present, be open. But it's not always that we're in a good vibe situation. What about in Dukkha, when it's a difficult situation, when there is pain, when there is suffering? Then Patanjali advocates Karuna, which means compassion. So when things are pleasant and agreeable, be friendly. When there is difficulty and suffering, be compassionate. Third type of situation, Punya. When you see people doing wonderful things, what does Patanjali advocate? Mudita, let it fill you with joy, let it lift you up. So sometimes in the world, like I was born in a country that's called England sometimes, or United Kingdom. In the UK, there's this thing called the tall poppy syndrome. Like the poppy flower grows up and sticks out above the rest of the grass. And people like to chop the, the person who stands out now. When we see people doing wonderful things, some people might be jealous, some people might be critical. Other times I might see somebody doing something wonderful and think, oh man, I'm so terrible and I'm so, you know, why aren't I more like them? But Danny says, forget those uh, self-harming reactions. Instead, when you see people doing wonderful things, let it fill you with joy and inspiration. Let it lift you up. Now just imagine you live in a neighborhood where when people were having a nice time, they're generous, they're present, they're kind and friendly. When there is suffering and pain, people are compassionate. When people do good things, people celebrate it. If you practice these things, what will you think about the world? 
if you live in a neighbor where everybody else practices them too. Not such a bad place after all, yeah? So then, fourth situation, apunya. When you see people doing terrible things, when there is injustice or tyranny, where there is horror and terror, then Patanjali advocates upeksha. And upeksha sometimes gets translated by a word that can be misleading. And the reason, I think, is because many translators have copied a translation from the 19th century <laughs> in which the translator used the word indifference. But in the 19th century, indifference had a strong sense of it doesn't make a difference to my center. These days, if you hear indifference, what do you think? You don't care. Like you don't care. But that's not what it used to mean in the 19th century. And that's not upeksha. Upeksha means each. It's the verb each with the prefix upa. So it means to, each means to look at, to examine closely. Upa, as if from a high vantage point. So in other words, it means equipoise and equivision. Equanimity. Engage with the situation, but as if you are looking at it from a high vantage point. So don't let it rob you of your center. So if I see something terrible, but I become angry or frustrated or fearful, what happens to my capacity to respond skillfully? It plummets, yeah, it goes way down. So the idea is that upeksha, this equipoise, this steadiness, will be the natural fruit of practicing Maitri Karna Murita. If, whenever things are agreeable, we're friendly and open. When there is pain and suffering, we're compassionate. When we see wonderful, beautiful things, we let it inspire us. Then, when we face challenging situations, when we face injustice or tyranny, things that would be potentially very destabilizing, we've empowered ourselves to be able to meet them from a steadier place, from which we can perhaps share into the field an influence that's going to be more conducive to the restoration of harmony. Now, Patanjali continues describing how we cultivate yoga. And in the next few sutras, they all contain a particular particle which you've already encountered. So potentially goes on. Pachardana vidarana bhyam va pranasya vishayavati va pravritirutpanna manasastrinibandini vishoka va jyotishmati avitaragam vishayam va chittam svapna nidra jnana dambanam va yatabhimadhyana dva. So maybe you notice that this va sound. So the next few sutras, 34 to 39, they all have the particle va, which means and, or, as well, in addition, optionally. But Sutra 33, Maitri Karana Murita Upeksha, no va. So when we look at the sutra text and we see 34 to 39, they all have the particle va, no va in 33, what does this tell us? This is the essential yoga practice. This is the obligatory practice. This is the practice you have to do if you want to practice yoga. Maitri Karana Murita Upeksha. When things are nice and agreeable, good vibes, be friendly and open. When things are difficult, where there is pain and suffering, be compassionate. When there is beauty and wonder and merit, celebrate it, let it lift you up. When there is injustice, horror, terror, be steady, be equanimous, so you can meet it as skillfully as possible. And this is also not just an instruction, it's a, it's a prescription and a description. So here Patanjali is describing how a yogin, one who's established, will respond to life. When things are agreeable, do we automatically stay open, receptive and friendly? If yes, then I'm in yoga. If no, then oh, I need to keep practicing. If when I encounter pain and suffering, compassion just flows from me, then I'm established in yoga. If not, I keep practicing. If when I see beauty and wonder and merit, I feel inspired, I feel so much joy, I know I'm in yoga. If not, I keep practicing and so on. And so 34 to 39, these subsequent sutras, they give us literally thousands of meditation support resources encoded in just a few sutras. So in these sutras, potentially basically offers us so many means we can use to cultivate that meditate, to cultivate that state of integration and balance. And the first one, it's interesting what he says, Prachardana Vidarana Abhyam Va Pranasya. 
We can use prana, we can use the movements of the life force in and out of our body and around us as the focus. So as long as we're breathing, we have resources we can use to cultivate that steady awareness. We can allow ourselves to notice and experience the movements of the breath, its retentions, its movements in and out. And this can be our support. Or we can focus on subtle sense objects, such as a mantra or a visualization. We can work with any of the sense powers, touch, sight, sound, taste, smell. All of these things, they can be lenses, supports, 